I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, uh, to Netfla and IPS for putting this together, um, and for Bus Bo to Bus Boys for hosting this, and to you all for coming. Um, I'm going to go through a quick presentation, a very short version of the larger presentation. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Burroughs, is going to say a few words, and then we're going to hear from uh, two of our contributors to the book as well, uh, as much as possible at least, uh, uh, Raymond Bush and A. Peter Bailey. And then we want to open it up for a conversation. We want to, to, to leave as much time for that as possible, uh, since I know our time is short. But initially, just very quickly, what our goal was, was that we wanted to put together a collective of responses, critical responses. Um, the mandate we were given by Paul Coates at Black Classic Press that we happily accepted was that we wanted a critical response. We didn't want any essays in the book that were at all uh, congratulatory or apologetic to what Marable had done uh, for a number of reasons. We wanted a, a collection of, and there's Paul Coates right there, it's perfect time. Uh, we wanted a, a, a collection of, uh, as I said, critical responses by people who have actually read Marable's book and then who would comment specifically on that book. Uh, and that sounds simple, but it initially was a little bit more difficult than we had expected in terms of getting people to contribute. A, because it did, we did require that you have had to have read that 600 page book. And that you had something critical to say. And either people had not read the book, or they didn't have something critical to say, or they didn't want to say what they had, they didn't want to say what they wanted, to, what they thought publicly. Um, challenging Meg Marable is not necessarily a career booster. It's not necessarily something that's going to get you welcomed with open arms in the spaces that many of us at least you know, want to be welcomed into, whether or not we claim that. Um, uh, so it was a little more difficult than we thought, but what we ended up with in taking our time and with careful editing and a really wonderful editor or editorial process, we put together a very strong volume of well-researched responses to Marable's book. Um, so I'm just going to go through a little bit briefly here to just very quickly, I always start with this because this is really the only way that I can really approach it, is that I, that, that, or that I prefer to approach it. Everything is, is that, as I discuss it, is in the, in the context of colonialism, an ongoing imperialist project um, that internally colonizes black America and others within the United States, and then sets sort of the foundation for how we are to interact and the role media are to play. Um, so I won't belabor that too much. Uh, but maybe we can come back to that. And this, of course, requires media to serve uh, uh, the purpose of psychic violence, uh, media to become weaponry. I'm going to speed through this because I know we're really short on time. But as, as the founders of my field of study claim, uh, whether we acknowledge it or not, media and communication studies was put together to study how to manipulate people uh, um, using media as a warfare apparatus, as part of the warfare apparatus. And part of what I'm trying to say is that, that at least for me, Marable's book fits into that function of uh, serving as, a, a, as propaganda, psychological warfare, psychic violence, to set definitions for society, to determine how we are to interpret our, our surroundings, our lives, and in this case, the history and politics of Malcolm X. So as we said at the beginning, it was an honor to be asked uh, by Paul Coates and Black Classic Press to put this book together. Uh, and then as we say here, more than false, we have by book title unapologetically laid down our claim that this reinvention of Marables is a lie. It is the carefully constructed and intentional political reshaping of one who is as important a conduit for and exemplar of militant politics as the world has ever seen. Uh, so this is in part why we didn't take it lightly that Malcolm, more than just a man himself, represents a worldview that is as relevant today as ever uh, and is as under attack uh, today as it ever, has ever been. So take your time. Oh, right, I still want to get to I still want to get to So the bases of our challenge, or as one of our contributors, Margot Arnold, writes, why uh, Marable has given the black radical collective consciousness the blues. I'll summarize this way. Poor scholarship. The book is simply uh, just poorly put together academically, journalistically. It fails all the basic criteria of citation, referencing, um, uh, attribution. It is just a poorly put together book where most of its salacious claims, the most salacious claims in it, have the least amount of support. 
It is not revelatory. Part of, going back to part one, point one. The book, that, despite its claims, does not offer anything new. If you're familiar with Malcolm X scholarship or Malcolm X himself, the book really doesn't offer that much new despite its claims to doing so. And the not newness, <laughs> the not newness of the book is also not properly attributed. In other words, Maribel borrows heavily from many of the scholars he dismisses in the pages of his book, particularly on page 490, where he says all of the books written in the 1990s about Malcolm X were more or less useless. Um, yet he borrows from them heavily in recreating aspects of Malcolm's history and politics since the assassination without properly attributing the source of his information. So he's just giving it to readers as if it's brand new, something that he developed on his own. It is establishment revisionism. In other words, coming out of an elite scholar from an elite university, Columbia University, with an elite press, Viking Press, one of the uh, subsidiary of Penguin, one of the largest, six largest publishing houses in the world. The view you get of Malcolm by the end of the book, in very, with very, uh, uh, with great skill and nuance, is a version of Malcolm that is meant to defend the status quo. That is very, again, establishment friendly anti-revolutionary version of Malcolm X. It is ideological, as I would, as I'm arguing at least, ideological, it's ideological propaganda, psychological warfare, targeting, to name just but a few things, black nationalism, pan-Africanism, Kwame Nkrumah, Marxism and Leninism, anti-imperialism, armed struggle, and it doesn't mention, as Mumia Abu-Jamal points out, doesn't even mention the counterintelligence program. Uh, and in the process of not mentioning the, the counterintelligence program, uh, because to do that would require a re-characterization uh, of the relationship that black people have to the state itself, that Maribel and his publishers don't want to deal with. So when you, you, as you read the book, he not only leaves out the counterintelligence program, but the FBI just reads as sort of this innocent bystander hanging out in the background, just trying to monitor things, not as an active agent in subversion, subversion or the, <laughs> the, the, the dissolution of the relationship between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad, or the setting up of Malcolm, Malcolm to be targeted for assassination. None of that is done. Zach Kondo does that wonderfully in his book, written in the 90s, so therefore it had to be dismissed by Marable. Uh, Claiborne Carson, even in his book on the FBI files of Malcolm X, starts off by giving you, it has a section called something, I think, African, African America or Black America and the State, or Malcolm X and the State, where he reorder, he, he reminds you of the real relationship between Malcolm X and the state itself that Marable does not do. Because again, uh, Marable, coming from the establishment perspective, a very liberal, democratic, socialist perspective, cannot, as our contributors argue, um, is not in the best place to interpret the radicalism and the revolutionary activity of a Malcolm X. To sort of make my point, to summarize my point, and I'm so sorry I didn't see this video before we went to print, I just want to show a seven minute excerpt of a speech given earlier this year by Wendy Wolf, who as she says herself, uh, worked very closely with Manning Marable as an editor and a publisher with Viking Press. And I think, as you'll see, in this seven minute clip of her hour long speech, you will see how she, for, for us, quite thankfully, for us, um, gives us legitimacy and justifies. Before he was at Johnson Publication, he was the editor of the Black Lash Newsletter. The Black Lash Newsletter was the newsletter of the OAAU. So you are seeing with you right now someone who was with Malcolm X from the forming of the OAAU until his assassination. This is A. Peter Bell. Thanks, Todd. And I want to, uh, again, to thank uh, Todd and Jared for, for pulling this uh, book together. Uh, when they first called me about doing it, I was really working on a memoir. Uh, of my involvement with Brother Malcolm. And I told them, I said, you know, I am not going to stop working on my memoir to take time to read this 670-page book. <laughs> and so Todd said, but you got to do something. So I said, here's what I will do. I was interviewed by Marable for that book. 
And the only reason, because I had basically kind of stayed away from being interviewed. A lot of people who've written books called me and I always said no. But I agreed to do this one because Cheryl Green, who was an old friend of mine, was working with Maribel as part of his research team. So she called me one day and said, you know, would you come up to Columbia? I was living in Richmond, Virginia. No, I was, I was in D.C. at the time, 2003. But I come up and have lunch with them and, and you know, and ask the question, and let them ask me some questions and respond. So I said, okay. So I went up and, and, and uh, at the lunch, Maribel's at the lunch, and, and uh, numerous members of his research team. So I told Todd, I said, Todd, here's what I'll do. I would just uh, respond to the things that, that what he mentions me in the book, where he takes things from that interview to try to reinforce some of the distortions and the lies and the misleading statements that he was making in the book. And that's what I would do, and that's what I did. That was my contribution uh, to the book. When I finally got around to reading the entire book, you know, um, I found something in the epilogue that told me what Maribel's book was all about. Maribel's, uh, one, I thought, of course, I thought it was, it was he was enhancing, as Jared said, he was enhancing his position in the white academic world. I mean, that's how you get black folks get books published. You had to write a book attacking someone like a brother Malcolm on that level, or you write one of those How I Grew Up in the Ghetto and Got Saved. Type books. It was, about the only two, it was about the only two books from black people nowadays wow. that, the, that the big, quote unquote, mainstream type publishers really look for. It's very difficult to get anything else done by them. But when I read uh, the thing in Marvel's book where he quotes me, they got me most upset. One, the one other thing that I say were like distortion. There was one thing that was just like a total misinformation. And that's where he's talking about, the, you know, I was, as Todd said, I was the editor of the OAU's newsletter. Uh, that was my entry into journalism. I'm a journalist today because of Brother Malcolm, because he made me understand the importance of the gathering and distribution of information. And that if you had an organization, you had, you, you had to control your own source of, you know, of information. And so we had a little mimeograph newsletter. And I was, the, I was mainly the editor and uh, a brother named Leonard Sneed was the, the production and layout. So I had been, uh, on the day before, on February the 20th, 1965. You know, by now, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm like a big time editor now, you know. I'm, you know I've, done about, I've done nine newsletters now, you know, so like I'm an editor now. So I'm, I'm, I imagine me, 26 years old, and I am bugging Brother Malcolm with all, you know, all the things he's involved in and, and what he's doing and the pressure he's under. And I am bugging him by writing the article for the newsletter. So finally he agrees. On February the 20th, 1965, the day before the assassination, he walked in and gave me an article that was going to be published for me to publish in the next issue of the newsletter. I also that day presented him with a, a press release that I had written, basically reaffirming our support of him because, you know, that had been the banning, his being banned from entering into France, and then the second thing was the firebombing of his home. So I wrote a release, and I don't know what I had in that release, but when I showed it to Brother Malcolm, he read it, and he said to me, Brother Peter, I wish you would not distribute this at the rally the next day. I was going to distribute it at the rally the next day. He said, I wish you would not distribute this. So I said, okay, and, and put it away. Now, I did that without question because at my the very first newsletter and my very first article I ever wrote was about the, the shooting of young James Powell by Officer Thomas Gilligan that launched the Harlem Uprising in 1964. That was the first article I ever wrote, and they wrote it in the very first, our very first newsletter. And Brother Malcolm was in, in, uh, in uh, at the time, was in uh, Ethiopia, no, no, in Cairo at the old Organization of African Unity meeting. And he was calling back to the office, and, and those of us who were who involved with various aspects of the organization, you know, we were reporting to him. So when it was my turn, I read to him what I had written. I said, eyewitnesses to the murder. And he stopped me. He said, Brother Peter, you can't use the word murder and murderer, because those are legal terms. You can only call him that when he's convicted, and we know he's going to be acquitted. Hmm. He said, call him a killer and refer to it as a killing because he's a killer 
and it's a killing no matter what the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So we had already read those things off in the old-fashioned mimeograph machine. So rather than redo them, we scratched out the word murder and wrote killing in it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that's how, and sure enough, when Gilligan was acquitted, he sued both SCLC and court for distributing a flyer calling him a murderer. So when he asked me to not distribute that newsletter, I said, hey, you know, I knew he was, he knew what he was talking about. So I gave that whole, you know, thing to, to, uh, to uh, Marable them in my, when they interviewed me. I read the book and it says that, it says, when Brother Malcolm, no, when Malcolm X came into the Audubon Ballroom that day, which is the 21st, he was immediately, he immediately encountered, no, he was immediately encountered by A. Peter Bell. Now just the word, in, you know, you know, I don't do no encountering, Brother Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just that term, really, you know, I got immediately started getting angry. Then he says that he ordered me to not distribute the Black Lash, which was the name of our newsletter. Now, first of all, it was not the Black Lash. It was not, it was a, it was a one page uh, press release type of thing. It was not done, this, this, this did not happen on February the 21st, it happened on February the 20th, you know, uh, the, the Saturday before. And, and, and there was no kind, and I, when people said, well, what do you get us? I said, you know, I'm not going to have my last, you know, one of my last dealing with Brother Malcolm as though we had some kind of hostile uh, uh, meeting. Because what happened, and I always tell students this when I do lectures with him, he asked me, when he came in that Sunday, he asked me, he said, Brother Peter, when you get a chance, come backstage. I want to talk to you. So I said, okay. I, about five or six minutes, I went backstage. Now, this brother under all this pressure. All these things are happening around him. And you know what he said to me? He said, I, I know you put a lot of work in uh, the, the, the release that you wrote, and I hope you understand why I asked you to not distribute it. He's concerned about my feelings. And, 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 and Marable, in the way he reported the whole thing, turned it into some kind of almost hostile like of, uh, of, of, of encounter. That is what really annoyed me about that book when I, first, when I just read the section. And there are other things in other sections, but I would, I mean, for time, I'm not going to go into on, go those right now. But, but that was the kind of thing that disturbed me about it. I had read Zach Condo's book. I knew Zach's book, and Zach had interviewed me. Zach's book to me is the definitive book on the assassination of Brother Malcolm. He wrote that himself. He published it himself. He, the documentation is just unbelievable. But there, but, and, and so when I hear people who probably don't know Zach Condon, but you know Zach went to Bowie State, was a professor at Bowie State, you know, and then Bowie State don't matter. You know, now when you talk about somebody who's at Columbia or Yale and, you know, and all those places, you know, Bowie State University, after somebody at Bowie State University to write a book on anything. Mm. And, and so, so that, so he gets no credit. But that book is, is if you ever get a chance, if you haven't read it, read it. Uh, unra uh, uh, conspiracies Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X by Zach Condon. So, when I finally read the entire book, I came across this statement. Huh? Oh, yes, okay, I'm sorry. I thought my voice was loud enough. I put my glasses on. By the final moment, by the final uh, months of his life, by the final months of his life, we talk about Brother Malcolm. He resisted identification as, as he resisted he re resisted identification as a black nationalist, seeking ideological uh, shelter under the race neutral, folks, the race neutral <laughs> concepts of Pan Africanism and Third World Revolution. Yeah. Now, the minute I read those words, <laughs> I didn't have to know nothing else. <laughs> about what Madden Merrill was trying to do in this book. It was an attack on the whole ideological concept of black nationalism. And this has been, this is, he's not the first one to do this. Many white scholars and academic types, I don't care whether they're the conservative to most liberal, they really, really, really get nervous about the whole concept of black nationalism. 
and they try to make it sound as it was some kind of, you know, loony type of, 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 of political ideology, and that black nationalists believe that, that black people can function by, by themselves in the world with no, con no contact and no relationship with anybody else in the world. That's a very unintelligent position, and most black nationalists that I knew, and Brother Malcolm most definitely, was not unintelligent. But when I read that, that said to me what Maribel was all about. Another thing that, that gave me a clue to where he was is that and Brother Malcolm was on the campaign to take the United States government for the UN Commission on Human Rights. I mean, he was serious about this. He was, he was serious about this. He went to the OAU conference in Cairo in 1964, and this was his goal. I have a copy of the entire statement that he made around this whole issue. As a result of what he did, the African countries, heads of state, issued a resolution. Racist America blasted by Africa. That was, I'm sure that our, the OAAU newsletter is probably the only publication in America that published that entire resolution. Now, Marigold, in his book, calls it a tepid resolution. If you put that into the context of the Times, 1964, Exactly. The United States is involved in a tremendous propaganda battle with the Soviet Union. Africa being a target of both of them. And Brother Malcolm convinced the African leadership to issue a, I, I said in my, in my memoir, it's not the most militant resolution in the world, but the fact that they issued anything of this type scared and got the FBI and the CIA and all those boys extremely nervous. The fact that he was able to get that done. And for Marable to describe it as he got a tepid resolution by the African heads of state, that was another clue as to where he was coming from. So I just want to say again, thank the folks. One thing about the book that impressed me is that uh, it took enough time so that by the time I think most of us got down to writing it, we had kind of cooled down some. <laughs> <laughs> so the book is not a lot of ranting and raving. The book is solid, well written, documented. The arguments are presented seriously, and and uh, so you know, so it was kind of glad that uh, before we you know started writing, we had a period of time where we could rather than running out there and trying to write right away and, and write a whole lot of ranting and raving. Uh, which, of course, is exactly what they would expect from us. I think that they're going to be very, very surprised uh, at the caliber uh, uh, and, and, and of this book and how it, how it completely kind of deals with. Uh, my whole question with, with Maribel, I'm trying to find out if, it's, if I'm being intellectually dishonest, because my position right now with my memoir is not even mention this book. <laughs> no. Now, I could not, and I'm not talking about our book. I'm talking about not to mention Maribel's book. Because I don't want my memoir to be considered some kind of answer to Man America. I don't think he's worth that. You know, so I'm still debating as whether or not I should include anything about his book in my memoir. I haven't made my, you know, a final decision on that yet. Thank you very much. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.